Yes. Good day, good evening, good morning to everyone who listens to us. This is a uh, GEF talk series, Global Education Futures series on the future of education. And uh, my name is Pavel Luksha, and my co-host today is Alexander Laszlo. And we would like to welcome our guest and our speaker, uh, Gary Jacobs. Uh, Gary is uh, the uh, president and the CEO of uh, World Academy of Art and Science, chairman of the board and the CEO of uh, the World University Consortium, uh, distinguished professor of interdisciplinary studies at Person-Centered Approach Institute, and executive director of uh, International Center for Peace and Development in Napa, California. And I think there are many more titles, Gary, that you bear. But we are meeting today um, because you do so much in the area of education, supporting uh, the transformation, support, supporting the discovery of uh, the new paradigm in education. And uh, you work a lot in India with uh, some of the leading uh, Indian uh, institutions and uh, consortiums in education and you uh, seek new ways to, to really make education work in the 21st century for young people, for adults. So Gary, welcome. And we would like, first of all, to invite you to share your thoughts on how you see the future of education, what transform, what changes in this decade and beyond. And then we will engage in a discussion with you. So welcome. Thank you, well, Pavel. Um, uh, I, I think I, I, you wanted to pass it to me, right? Yes. Um, so just uh, to uh, also to, to say a little here for everyone who's tuning in that the, the pleasure of being in this conversation, in these mm -hmm. GEF talks about the future of education is that this is a playground, an exploration ground a chance for us to really let our hair down. Of course, in, in Gary's, in my case, and in, in, in Pavel a bit, a bit less, it's not, we've already been not doing much. that for a very long time. <laughs> but um, really, I think uh, what we get to do is explore not only the trends, what is going, the hard facts, and so on. And there's a lot of educational analysis uh, is uh, based on those kind of uh, considerations but we get to really listen to and learn with luminaries. And I'm not using that word lightly when I, when I refer to Gary here, uh, because what we have uh, with us uh, in, in an embodied and incarnate form is someone and some energy that really is life affirming and future creating. So together, as we listen with Gary, I would invite you to listen not only for the ideas and the concepts, but also listen with your heart. Listen what is right, what is resonance. And then hopefully we will be getting your questions, your comments, and we will weave them into our conversation as we explore the future of education with Gary Jacobs. Gary, thank you so much for being with us. Well. Thank you, Alexander. Thank you, Pavel. Uh, I'm really delighted to be here with uh, the Global Education Futures. I'm a great admirer of the work you do. Uh, and uh, we, I look at the GEF as a good partner for the World Academy and our, global, our World University Consortium. And this is just a wonderful opportunity to informally uh, chat and exchange ideas with you and uh, those who have joined, and I hope we are informal, and I hope anybody's ready to interrupt me or challenge me at any time. I'm not trying to be provocative, but I would like to be interactive. Uh, uh, I'd like to start by sharing with you my perspective on why this is so important. And uh, from a historical perspective, <clears throat> human life came on earth, according to, I'm not a physical anthropologist, but somewhere, depending on how you count, somewhere between 100,000 and 200,000 years ago, the, the human species of sorts began. And yet, 
agriculture uh, as a as a as an as an activity only began about 10,000 years ago and it raises a really interesting question what was humanity in all our varieties and species doing for 100 to 200,000 years <laughs> before we figured out the very obvious thing we it's obvious to us now uh, that we don't have to roam all around the world trying to get food, especially when the seasons change. We can stay in one place, plant the crops, grow them, and all. But in fact, what looks so obvious to us, because we all learn it in kindergarten and uh, uh, at least the rudimentary aspects of, we know that seeds grow into plants now. We know you need water, you need sunlight, you need soil, you need fertilizer and everything. But they didn't know it. And it took at least 100,000 years of observation and experimentation to even figure out that this was possible. And that's when civilization really began. And I mentioned that in the beginning because it has everything to do with education. What we lacked as a species was we didn't have the knowledge to pass on to next generations. The knowledge we have today is the cumulative knowledge of 100,000 years. And though we often make mistakes and repeat the mistakes of the past, the whole theory of education is we can learn from all the cumulative experience of humanity in the past and start off today with that learning and go forward and move beyond the past and not have to repeat, reinvent the wheel or uh, rediscover the, the, the value of avoiding war and, and, and so forth and so many other things. So... My reason for saying this is, I think that education is the most important invention of humanity because it's that which has altered us and from the other species. Of course, it's our, our consciousness development that made that possible, but they didn't come automatically with consciousness, with the birth of the mental consciousness. It took centuries and millennium to learn how to preserve knowledge, organize it, and pass it on. And we're still learning. So in that sense, I'd have to disagree with my friends, the technologists, who say, after all, all of the progress of humanity is due to inventions of technology. We couldn't live without them, and we couldn't have this Zoom call without them. So it, it, the value is, is obvious. But uh, without education, we'd be repeating the same mistakes. <laughs> that have been going on in past centuries and millennium. So I rank it number one. But that comes with a, a caveat, a qualification. Because if we're going to give credit, and I'd like to give generous credit to education over the last 200 years, uh, to the spread of education and more and more the universalization and the professionalism and the development of knowledge and all, for our achievements, certainly as one of the most important reasons, then we also have to ask ourselves, what about our problems? What about our mistakes? What about the, the areas where we're not, don't seem to be learning and we haven't gone beyond the past and we are reinventing the wheel or reinventing the, the, the nuclear bomb and going back to it and we still haven't outgrown war? Uh, what about that? What about the fact that for two centuries we had an economic systems or economic philosophy that we were teaching that ignored the word environment? <laughs> uh, and because of that, we ignored the word environment uh, and the concept of environment and didn't pay much attention to the impact of our human actions on the environment until the point, the point where we're in a global crisis. So that too, in some sense, has to be connected back to limitations in the education we have. Today, our problem is more severe because the pace of social evolution is so quick. The pace of technological development is so quick, blindingly fast, that it's more and more difficult for us to keep pace with the speed of change. You know, when I was growing up uh, in the, uh, I'm 76 now, so you can figure out when I was growing up uh, after World War II, I was the baby boomer generation, first year after the end of World War II. 
I was part of that generation, which ended up as the hippies in the 60s. Uh, and I had more hair then <laughs> than I do now. Uh, but uh, at that time, you know, we were, we were taught by professors and teachers who were in their 50s or 60s who had studied if I if I had them in the four, in the in the sixties and the seventies, they studied in the twenties and the thirties before World War II, before the Great Depression and everything. And they studied from people who had been born and grew up 30, 40, 50 years earlier than that. And education changed much more slowly than the progress of life in the last 50, 75 years. And we have a system that's inherently conservative in its main job has been to conserve all the knowledge we've accumulated in the past. <laughs> but now the, 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 the quantum of data, I won't call it knowledge, but the quantum of data that's pouring in and, uh, and information that's pouring in is coming in at such a rate, nobody can keep pace with it. Nobody can absorb it all. And so I, I think we're in a time warp. Our educational system geared up to the past, geared up to the earlier methods that worked, that brought us this far, is simply not able to cope with the speed of social evolution today. And therefore, when we say, and I would like to say we need a new paradigm in education, we need it not out of an inherent fault of the people who are in the system, but that the system has to go, we have to go forward. We have to reinvent the system. And when I say reinvent it, I mean in terms of the pedagogy, in terms of the content, and even in terms of the delivery systems for it. Because uh, for many reasons, we're simply not able to either keep pace with the knowledge, uh, communicate it effectively to uh, to enough of it and the right part of it to enough people and not able to reach out to everybody who needs it. About eight years ago, UNESCO published a report uh, estimating that over a 15-year period, that is from maybe 2015 to 2030, take these as guesstimate numbers, uh, they estimated that we would have to create a university the size of Harvard, five a week for every week for the next 15 years in order to accommodate the rising number of youth who wanted to enter higher education. How many hundreds of years it took us to create one Harvard? <laughs> and Harvards don't spring up just because you build buildings there. And where are you going to get the people for them? Uh, in India, the India prides itself on its Indian Institutes of Technology, which are the, the, the highest rated of the institutions. Today, about 40% of the, there's vacancy for about 40% of the faculty. They're able to get students. They're not able to get the qualified faculty they need in a country which has surplus of people and a, a lot of educated people. So how are we going to meet that? And by the way, the UNESCO statistic was not to meet the full demand of the world. It was those who would be able to afford and demand education. And they estimated if that was 100 million or so in 15 years, they said there's another 100 million that won't even be able to have access or won't qualify for it. So clearly the delivery system that we have, it's not accessible, it's not affordable. Uh, and then the question is, uh, are we teaching the right thing and are we teaching it in the right way? And this was the work that we've been doing in the academy and why we started the World University Consortium really more as a think tank than, uh, than a consortium to really look at education in the global perspective, in an evolutionary perspective, to try to look not critically at what's being done, but creatively at what should be done. I know GEF is got a, a very similar uh, perspective on in order to address these problems. Uh, one of the things that uh, about the uh, about the pedagogy, uh, I do a lot of info. I don't teach formally in educational institute now. <laughs> I I do a lot of lectures and conferences and everything. But I run my own group where of 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 
students, adult students on a daily basis, five times a week. And I have found out secret of education is you learn most when you teach other people. And that's my personal experience. I can read something and understand it. But when I have to communicate it to other people, it becomes so much more real and live to me. And even if my students thank me for what they, I have taught them, I, with great sincerity, I thank them for what I have learned by the discussion. But we've got an educational system today, and I realize it varies significantly from South India, where we run a school, to Northern uh, California, where I had my education. But still, with all the generalizations to it, we still got a system that is essentially pumping in information, a passive system, which is expecting the students to acquire and learn, memorize, a competitive system. You know, all the studies of big companies in the US has shown that uh, they want to hire people who their number one skill is not technical that they want. They want people who know how to cooperate and work well with other people. I come from Napa, California, that's the wine country. And about 25 years ago, we started a new high school there, it became called New Technology High. But the whole focus of it was not so much the technology, it was the learning. It became a cooperative group learning where they'd have students in groups of four or five as a learning teams, teaching each other. And this model became so, it was a cooperative learning. Instead of competing with the rest of the students in the class to see who gets the highest marks uh, and who gets the best admission, they thrive by learning how to teach each other better and cooperate more. Uh, and that qualified them that they were exactly what companies wanted. People who know how to cooperate, people who know how to work as a team, because once you get into a company, you hardly do anything by yourself. <laughs> You're responsible. So we need a new paradigm. And by the way, the Napa model has spread. I, the last time I looked was a few years ago, but there were about 150 school districts in the US which had at least one uh, school on this model. And they did many other things too. Active learning, cooperative learning, uh, where uh, self uh, uh, participative learning uh, and I know there are places in the world that do it very well. We try to do it here, but I know it's definitely not the prevailing paradigm uh, uh, that's uh, that's spreading out uh, all over the world. So that's this is a I'm talking about a shift from the idea that our education is to teach the student a subject. The student becomes the subject. The development of the student, his capacity for thinking, his capacity for interacting, not his capacity to memorize and give the right answer. Uh, and the more we shift the focus from the subject matter, and we've all had enough of that in our classical years of education uh, to know what it is, to developing the person, uh, the more we're really doing what I think education is all about, equipping youth for the future. And Pavel, in your opening remarks, you know, today humanity faces unprecedented, we have unprecedented achievements. <laughs> no society in the history of the world has had this level of prosperity or productivity or knowledge, technological capacity. And oddly enough, in spite of all the horrors that we are reading every day, the real horrors, the mortality rates, uh, our violence rates are lower than they've ever been in history. Maybe the last one year is, an ex is spoiling the statistics of it. But compared to the number of people are there, compared to those the, the hundreds of millions who don't have enough food, who don't have employment, who don't have economic security and everything, we're far from meeting the needs of humanity. We've, we went through two years of COVID and lost, nobody knows how many millions of people, but you know, probably close to what we lost in World War II. Uh, uh, but somehow it was, it's okay because it was only a disease. There wasn't an enemy there. Our enemy was the uh, disease. 
and now we've got a war which is not only causing immense suffering uh, in in Ukraine and uh, and Russia and th- that region, but food shortages in Africa, uh, price inflation and job losses and unemployment. Apart from what Elon Musk is doing at Twitter, uh, you know, massive dislocations of economy around the world, trade competitiveness in trade, political divisions within countries like my own, you know, where uh, we've never seen this level of animosity between our own citizens, uh, our, our questioning about democracy, our questioning about human, human rights. I mean, we've got really serious problems now, and I haven't mentioned the real uh, elephant in the room, of course, and that's climate change, which dwarfs all the others. And my reason for mentioning them is not to, uh, not to f- be pessimistic, but to say, are we de- develop? Are we addressing them? If we are not addressing these kind of issues, and if our educational system is not preparing the next generations to be to understand them better and be more effective in addressing them, uh, then we're simply the time warp is is gotten to the point where it's really dangerous for the future of humanity, at least the way we know it. The civilization is the way we know it. And I don't know any other institution that I would like to bet on, rely on, to solve these problems. So unless we're going to solve it in education, unless we're going to raise new generations of youth who do much better than we do, I'm not trying to put the burden on them, but unless we're going to educate them to understand life and and survival and and cooperation and harmony and peace much better than we understood it when we were growing up. I grew up during the Cold War, uh, when kids in uh, in in the eighties, kids kids in kindergarten in prosperous America were drawing pictures of their homes with nuclear missiles coming down on them, uh, uh, and all. Are we going to go back to that? How are we going to change that? How are we going to get leaders who are more informed if we're not educating those leaders to think differently uh, than we think or have been thinking up until now? So that places a big burden of responsibility on education. The idea of business as usual, we're going to do what this is the way we learned and therefore we're going to teach it. That's just a disastrous (laughs) formula. It's a formula for disaster. It's not a formula. Today we have the resources, the money. We have about $450 trillion in global financial assets. We have the money, we have the technology, we have the organizational capability to address the needs of every person on earth, to provide security to every person on earth. That's what our research at the World Academy has shown and been confirmed over and over. But we're doing a terrible job of doing it. In fact, what's missing? What's missing is not the physical capacities. What's missing is the the understanding, the motivation, the determination, the values, the commitment of of humanity. And if they're not getting that from our education, if the youth are not getting that and getting it better than we got it, uh, 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 then how do we expect the next generation to do better? Uh, or are we going to just give up and say it's a hopeless case and climate is going up and uh, uh, and there's nothing we can do about it? Or we don't we didn't cause the problem, so we're not responsible. Then who is responsible? Uh, we ha- that's the value and importance of education uh, for me. Uh, so in in some, and I'm just my first point is uh, we need a change in education, not because there's something wrong with us, but because we all have to be much better than previous generations have been to meet the challenges uh, that are in front of us. We can't afford to cling to the past, to cling to tradition, to to say, well, education is an ancient thing and we're going to continue doing what we did and teaching what we were taught. It just won't work. We've got to invent if it, we invented it the first time, we can invent it again, and we can invent it better and better each time. And there are wonderful people, brilliant, dedicated people in education who are doing things, but it's not enough, and it's not going far enough, and it's not going fast enough 
uh, to meet our needs. So there's no sense just praising uh, uh, our strengths. We've got to recognize the, the, the magnitude of the, the problems. When I went to the university, it was uh, UC Berkeley uh, in the 60s when there were all the protests and the hippie movements were starting and everything. You know, we still learn things in a very traditional way. Economics is separate from political science. It's separate from e e psychology. It's separate from uh, e ecology. It's separate from technology and all. Uh, and uh, they're all separate from philosophy. That has nothing to do with philosophy or humanities or the arts or any of those things. I mean, that has that's completely irrelevant. <laughs> uh, uh, but what do we know today? What we know today in practice is that all of these dimen are dimensions of one thing. We cannot arbitrarily divide reality into these uh, academic disciplines. At last count, a few years ago, there were a thousand subdisciplines being taught in the United States. One thousand. And we're teaching more and more specialists. But what is our experience showing us? What we really need today are not more and more specialists who can do an open heart surgery or a liver transplant or uh, a, 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 a kidney surgery, automated kidney surgery so much. We need people who understand the world. We need to understand reality. Our political leaders, it doesn't do any good to just be a lawyer or just have gone through political science unless you understand economy and finance and human nature, and ecology, and, inter and international relations, uh, and public opinion, uh, and communications, and, and networking, unless we understand the whole thing, what we do is a double-edged sword. It's like uh, we did a, we collaborated with the IEEE a few years ago. They're the number one institution in the world for engineer, electronic engineers. Uh, I think their total membership's about half a million from all over the world. And our program was on artificial intelligence. And we had the leaders of the industry there, and I asked them, when you're educating youth in artificial intelligence, how much do they learn about the society in which they're going to apply this tech, they're developing technology to be applied? How much do they understand about the possible side effects and uh, of of the technology if it gets into the wrong hands or if it's not properly controlled. Uh, if How much does it impact on people in their, their psychology, their sense of security, and so forth? And they said, all of these things may be interesting, but none of them were, are being taught in our institutions. They may not be true of all institutions, but these were some, uh, some, some leaders who, who could speak representatively uh, from around the world. I said, then how can we expect technology is a double-edged sword? It, if it gets into the right hands and is used for the, per one, the, the right purposes, it's a miraculous thing. But it doesn't have to get into the hands of a bad person. It's enough it gets into the hands of an ignorant person <laughs> who doesn't understand how it's going to be used, who doesn't understand the society, who doesn't understand its impacts to lead to uh, uh, to problems. So we, we can't afford just to have over and over specialization. We've got to be able to prepare, to give youth a rounded education that gives us an understanding of the complex, fast-changing world in which we live. How do we do that? How do we do that? We are in the World Academy. We're starting a project with the United Nations in New York. It's called a Global Campaign on Human Security. And I'm just using it to illustrate. If you use the word security, if you talk to in academia about security, security means military. Security means the national defense. But what about the security of people? Food security, health security, water security, access to education, security that you'll have a job, uh, that you have an economic income or you have a pension, that your community is safe that you're personally safe and won't be discriminated against uh, because of your gender or your minority status or, or, or any other reason. And so we're working with the UN on a campaign to say, we've got to change our thinking about security. 
We need human security. Human, it's human beings who need to be secure, not nations. The nations are a people. If the people are insecure, they're not going to trust their governments. They're going to vote for crazy extremists who promise them uh, the moon. Uh, they won't be discriminating. They won't trust uh, the government, and governments are way down in the in the trust field. They'll believe some crazy stuff that comes on the social media or even in the the newspapers. Uh, we lose the social fabric if we if people lose a sense of security. So I'm just giving this as an. We need a change in thinking. In the academy, we've asked a question. Everybody wants, we know that knowledge is a very powerful gift. We need knowledge. But what do we mean by reliable knowledge? I mean, knowledge that's really going to help us and deliver the goods. And we came up with a conclusion that reliable knowledge is not what's passing for knowledge in our educational system. For one thing, a partial specialized knowledge that takes a small segment of the world or of reality and teaches us expertise in it without understanding the wider implications of how that fits into everything else. And the easiest example for all of us today is a knowledge of economy that doesn't understand the impact on the environment. There are many others, but that's enough, I think, of an illustration to prove the point. We cannot afford to be you know, a couple of years ago, I met a distinguished professor of labor at uh, at Yale. Uh, we were in a conference in the, in Europe, and I just wanted to talk to him and have a conversation. We were traveling in the car together to a conference, and so I asked him, "Well, I've been working. We've been doing a lot of work on employment," and he said, "Well, no, 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 that's not my field." I said, "I'm sorry. I thought you were a labor economist." Yeah, I'm a labor economist. I study the unions and everything, but job creation is a specialty. I, I, I don't know anything about it, so I'm not competent. <laughs> if we're going to split up labor <laughs> unions <laughs> and labor employment with the people who create jobs and how we create enough for them, uh, we're going to have society that's growing in many ways that may be growing, but it's, gr it's going to have growing problems and increasing problems uh, in future. So we need a concept of knowledge, which is much more holistic, interconnected, interdisciplinary. Actually, we prefer the term transdisciplinary, which doesn't get caught in the box of any particular discipline. It looks at society as a whole and says simply, how are we going to create the, the, the livelihoods necessary for keeping people uh, economically secure, which means that they can have health security and food security. Uh, and personal security as well, because they're not. So we need a change in a fundamental change in thinking, not just a change in the way we teach. Uh, we need a change in our delivery systems because they're not capable of delivering the quantity and quality and accessibility and affordability uh, we need. So we need radical change in how we deliver knowledge or how we make it available. Uh, these are, uh, I mean, uh, these are very big topics, and I'm throwing out topics just to illustrate, you know, some of the things that we're thinking about. You know, today the I know we have teachers in the probably in the group from everything from KG up uh, to uh, to university level. So uh, this this covers a lot of topics, uh, but. Uh, but what about the fundamental thing of how we teach our youth to think? How did we learn to think? I think when I was growing up, I learned something basic. Uh, you need to get the right answer. And in most cases, the right answer was either true and false. So you got two choices in a binary situation. Sometimes we had multiple choice. And one is right and one is wrong. I've learned something over the years, and one of the things I've learned is there's hardly ever a situation where there's one right answer, <laughs> where there's really one answer that fits, and all the others are wrong. And even with my worst enemies, I find it hard to find that there's somebody who doesn't have some truth in their point of view. But I've been taught since I was young that there's somebody who's on the right side with God behind his shoulder, and then the rest are on the wrong side. 
you know, one of the miracles maybe uh, of of the post World War II. You know, when I was growing up, I mean, what Germany did uh, in World War II, especially to the Jews, uh, uh, was something so un- horrendous that we could never think of ever forgiving them. But Germany became our <laughs> closest allies. <laughs> and our closest partners. And Japan, which had had the audacity to attack Pearl Harbor and betray all human uh, values, according to uh, Americans, that we would even drop nuclear weapons on them because they didn't deserve human treatment. They become our steadfast partners and uh, and, uh, and seats of, of democracy and everything. Have we learned something from that? That's not what we learned uh, growing up that uh, they're on the wrong side, we're on the right side, we're all the good, they're all the bad, and everything. So what about the way we think? And how do we, it's it's more fundamental, and I'm saying this because even if we have teachers in kindergarten and first grade, uh, we do here at our school, we found remarkably that from a very early age, we can teach children the relativity of knowledge and the fact that the other person's point of view, no matter how different it is from ours, has a validity to it. And we found the more we teach our kids, and the more we learn ourselves, because we're still learning, <laughs> to remember, to remind ourselves that the other person may also have a valid point of view, the more we're able to deal with the problems we have, the more we're able to deal with the conflicts and find ways to reconcile them and harmonize them. But the more we think in terms of this binary, this is separate and independent from that, and this is there's a right and there's a wrong, uh, the more we're teaching the ignorance that the world is suffering from uh, today. So I'm trying to say the kind of change we need, yes, we need a change in delivery systems and technology offers us, imagine today that uh, any student in the world, in any language, anywhere in the world, it's not quite true yet, but it can be very soon with the last mile connectivity, uh, can get the best quality instructors in the world to teach them in their own language <laughs> the best and latest knowledge that's there. And that's a system we have the capacity to make possible for everybody. A prob- one of our problems, we have many limitations, but one of them is our present system, the, the I'm talking institutions of higher learning now, uh, uh, if they support such a system, the professors say, what about me? Where's my job? <laughs> then, I won't, then I become superfluous. I become redundant. And the thing that I think at the university level that's holding us back so much today is that we've got the universities have a monopoly on certification. Supposing you just separate it out. I'm illustrating this just to show there are solutions. Supposing you just make certification independent from instruction. What does it mean? You can study any subject you want, any way you want. You can do it from home. You can do it on the internet. You can hire a retired uh, teacher or talk to your grandfather. but if you can, if you get the knowledge needed, and you can be independently certified and qualified by that, it would break down the monopoly of these institutions that are very cost, very costly. The, the cost of education is very high. They're very slow to change because that's the system. You get there, especially in areas where the professor has tenure and everything. Uh, it's fine in research, but uh, but we could open this up and we could have retired people, uh, retired not only teachers, but retired uh, business people, retired uh, every type of person using the knowledge they have and offering it to the world. Uh, and at a fraction of the cost, multiplying our capacity to pass on knowledge from one generation to another and to keep improving on that knowledge. So I'm just trying to say, I'm not just, I'm not trying to complain about the system. I'm trying to say there are solutions uh, for it. Uh, 
one of the things I was disappointed with, I studied psychology in uh, the university because I couldn't really figure out what I wanted to do. Uh, and it was just as well because I would, I've never been doing what I might have thought I would do at that time. But I really wanted to understand about people. Uh, and I thought that's the best way is to study psychology. Uh, with no offense to the psychologists who may be here, uh, I learned all the theories in psychology. I got straight A's in psychology. I got admitted to top graduate schools in psychology. <laughs> but I felt I hadn't learned anything about myself. Uh, and I said, if I don't learn about my, I, I mean, I was not interested in understanding just abnormal people who have uh, neurotic and psychotic problems and everything. I wanted to, what about the healthy person? <laughs> what do we, how do we grow? How do we learn? How do we uh, become happier? How do we become accomplished more? And that's not, at least in that generation, that's not what we were, uh, uh, how do we get along better with other people and understand them better? Why do we spend 60 years of experience learning the hard way for our mistakes <laughs> with other people? Why can't we learn it, this, these skills uh, as we're growing up. Uh, and I realized something else at that time that, uh, you know, our educational system deals with one, really one half of reality. I call it the objective side. You know, when the Enlightenment came and the scientific revolution came in the 16th century and after that, it was an, a revolt against the age of religion where the truth was in the Bible, and what the Bible tells you is is everything, and you you don't have to no experimentation, no thinking is not necessary. They burned all the the libraries and uh, you know that were created during the Roman times, <laughs> burned all the books, burned all the Greek uh, treasure classics and everything because don't bother thinking about it. We'll tell you what you should know, and we'll even read it to you and all. Uh, but we went to another extreme from everything is a matter of faith to everything is a matter of empirical experiment and external objective fact. But when we look at our life, it's not like that. The subjective dimension of our feelings, our attitudes, our aspirations, our values. I'm a business consultant when I'm not having fun talking about education and things like this. And I know for sure that in any company I've worked with and every uh, CEOs I've worked with, their personal motivation, their values, their aspirations, their determination, their strength is far more important than the external knowledge and skills they have. That's also important. The objective part of that is also important. But that's not what we've been learning. Economics has told us that prosperity is a question of designing the right system, the right financial system with the right laws and the right procedures. But what about with the right values? I mean, we've got businesses and we're working with the uh, with business communities too, big communities like the consumer electronics industry with the big five giants and everything and say, you know, uh, it, the values of these companies is going to have a major impact on the future of humanity. They may be technologically supreme, but if the only thing that were to drive them is the profit bottom line and shareholder value, uh, I mean, they'd be helping us sink the world. So isn't it important that every business leader as well as every educator, as well as every professional person, uh, knows the importance of what we feel inside, what motivates us, the motivations with which we act, the values with which we act, is really the determining power in the world as to whether our technology is going to work for us or against us. But this was off limits. You know, this was off limits when... Uh, uh, when I was being educated. No, we're scientists now. We're going to teach you economics as a science. Uh, we're, what about people? <laughs> what about the, the, the impact of, on, on people? No, no, we got the numbers. We got the statistics. You know, don't worry. Uh, our per capita GDP is going up. Yeah, of course, most of it's going to the richest 5% of the world. <laughs> and the rest is going uh, is not going up. But, uh, but no, no, we're doing our job. We're growing. 
And now we've been growing at the expense of the environment, at the expense of society. So I think you get uh, uh, the drift of my thought. Uh, uh, I think we can do much more. And we have the knowledge uh, to do much more. And maybe before I you know, uh, open it for, for questions, though uh, I've touched on a lot of things, I'd like to touch on one more. Uh, if you study the, the history of science and the great scientists of the last 200 years, you ask them, almost unanimously, they have come out on their own and said, look, my greatest discovery for which I've become famous was not something I figured out by my rational thinking and everything. It came to me just as a flash. It came to me as an intuition. And there are great quotes from Einstein and others about uh, the, this process. And I give one example of one of the greatest mathematicians of the 20th century was uh, Ramanujam from India, uneducated guy, formally not educated, not educated in math, he educated himself. He wrote more than 200 original theorems and they were of such a high quality that uh, a Professor Hardy from Cambridge, I'm talking about 100 years ago, brought him over. He couldn't even dress in a Western style or anything or uh, to study how he had developed these theorems. And he said, uh, you know, how did you prove them? How did you arrive at these conclusions and everything? And he said, I didn't. I saw them. I saw them in my mind and I wrote them down. They were intuitions. And they spent years working together to prove that his intuitions were correct. <laughs> and years they had to strive to figure out how you could calculate and get in, uh, something like this, which had never been done before. But the most remarkable part of the story for me, because uh, having lived in India for a long time, I, I've heard of things like, is not that Ramanujam could come up with 200 original formulas that ranks him among uneducated from uh, 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 they were reluctant to honor him at Cambridge. He finally became a fellow of the Royal Society, which was the number one uh, honor in the world for academic excellence. And finally, Cambridge reluctantly said, well, if he's a member of the Royal Society, we'll make him a fellow of, uh, of our college at, uh, at Cambridge as well. But nobody ever asked him the simple question, how do you have an intuition? <laughs> They made him prove, according to their mental calculations, a slow, slow process that he was right. But they never asked him, please teach us how to do it. And isn't that true of science today? The greatest scientists have said that intuitive knowledge goes beyond rationality and reaches heights and of knowledge and truth that we don't reach through our, our scientific method. But we don't even teach that fact. And we don't even try to teach how can we develop that faculty? And it's, I believe, and I that there that this has been known for hundreds of years, maybe thousands of years in other societies. Shouldn't we be trying to learn how to if there are higher faculties uh, open to our to human beings, shouldn't we be trying to learn how to develop them? Uh, and, and rather than ignore them and deny they even exist in order to prove or re reinforce the methods that for which I was educated and why I got a job, because I know how to prove a theorem or disprove it, <laughs> but I don't know how to create a new one. I don't know how to invent a new one. So I'm just pointing these things out just to say, I think the scope for our progress is enormous. And I look at that as a great promise. I'm very optimistic about our potential, but I would love to think that we don't have to go through total disasters <laughs> in order to motivate ourselves. We've been through enough disasters to learn from experience or to learn without experience, rather. Let's learn from the experience of past generations, not to be pushed to the wall and pushed to desperation before we decide to do something new. I take a breath and see uh, where we are. <laughs> wow. Gary. <laughs> That was what some people call tour de force. <laughs> Thank you for this uh, magnificent overview of challenges and possibilities. 
uh, that uh, we hold in the space of education and uh, transformation of education. And uh, I think we will have a lot of questions, Alexander, but I would like, first of all, to welcome your original remarks. <laughs> Well, just uh, really, I think we should pass this to the, the the questions that are already arising and they're coming in, Gary. And, and Good. again, just to, to add my thanks uh, and the spirit of inquiry, the invitation that you are placing before us is one not just to figure this out with the rationality, but exactly as you have piloted and 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 promoted uh, the 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 inquiry into the limits to rationality, right? a um, uh, uh, fantastic initiative and and what constitutes reliable knowledge that, that you shared with us. Is, and, and how do we teach to think? But how do we teach to sense? You know, I think these, these are the questions. So let me uh, let me perhaps bring one of the questions. I know um, uh, Ranangi is here as well and may have uh, things to, to share. Um, uh, and so her video is on. But there is a question from Professor Ashith Kaitan of Shiv Nadar College, who asks the following. He says, you mentioned about collaboration being a critical skill in the future. How do you see the role of technology to foster the same? That's a very good uh, question. Uh, you know, I looked, when I was growing up, it was the first generation with television. My parents didn't have TV when they were kids. We were the first generation of kids with television. And then you know what has happened since then and how far we have gone in technology. And when the PC came in the 1980s, I've oh, all, what did we miss? We had typewriters <laughs> and nobody learned. We didn't learn how to type in college because that was supposed to be the secretaries who type, not the, not the college graduates. And then suddenly we had PCs. And then in the mid nineties, we had the internet and now we've got the mobile they're not phones, they're, they're world computers and everything. Uh, I think the lucky thing about the younger generations is these are the most connected people that have ever lived on the earth. I didn't grow up in spite of the TV and everything. I didn't grow up in that generation. For us, we had a few friends, we knew the neighborhood, we knew the people we had gone to school with and everything. Uh, and over time, we lost touch with them. When I moved from New York to Los Angeles and then Los Angeles to Berkeley and then Berkeley to Hawaii and then Hawaii to India, every time I lost touch with the past and everything, the kids today are so interconnected. Got a young Indian uh, college student here, a graduate student here, whose favorite TV program are the Korean soaps. Uh, uh, and, you know, she knows everything from My Fair Lady and... Uh, uh, and pride and prejudice to what's what's playing in China and what's elsewhere. I think the technology is an instrument. We can use that instrument in many different ways, like the technology of the sword I was, the analogy of the sword I was giving. I think in terms of connectivity, I mean, the telephone was a great thing when we were growing up. You know, you could actually call, except it was expensive. To call from New York to Los Angeles to our relatives was a dollar a minute. My grandparents used to say, okay, three minutes is up. Uh, don't call, talk anymore. And to call from India home uh, was uh, at that time uh, about $4 a minute. And you had to wait three days in order to get a connection. <laughs> and now you get, in 30 seconds, you get a connection anywhere in the world for free. So I think the, the technology has helped us to connect with each other, learn about each other, learn about different cultures, interact with them, even from a great distance like this. It's a tremendous, unprecedented opportunity. In fact, when I look back on history, I'm talking really fundamental now, the history of the evolution, social evolution of humanity, you could you can simplify it and say the whole evolution has been growing from the isolated individual and the small community, disconnected and suspecting everybody else as an enemy or a threat or a competition, to the point where we're more and more growing into a global community. Okay, we haven't fully gotten there yet. We're still tied up in our nationality and our competitiveness and everything. But compared to any generation in the past, the cultural adaptation 
the tolerance levels, the exposure and knowledge of the rest of the world is unprecedented. And that's been because of the, the communication technology, the transportation. Cannot, I was the first generation of Americans who youth. One of the things they did while they were in college or after college, the first thing they did, they went to Europe. My parents never went to Europe <laughs> when they graduated. They both graduated. My father graduated from Harvard. Nobody thought of going to Europe for the summer to learn about other societies. Uh, even so, we have we are growing towards a more of one world. Uh, and to me, that's the create that's the secret. Maybe even more than education, the secret of our growing evolution as a species has been our growing interconnectedness and our sharing our sharing of information, our sharing of values, our, our sharing, our economic exchange and everything. We're not there yet. We've still got a lot of primitive at attitudes, competitive attitudes. We want to be better than the other one. We're afraid of the other one and everything. But compared with the past, if you read the literature of the 19th century in England, Thomas Hardy talks about a village uh, where somebody from London comes highly suspicious. <laughs> Don't, a city person, very highly suspect. He's an Englishman. No, no. He's from London. He's a city person. Don't trust them. Or from another village or town. Now we are we're so much more open. During World War II, we went and, uh, you know, in California, we had a large Japanese population. They created camps and locked all the, the Japanese American, Japanese Americans, because we didn't know whose side they would be on. Can you imagine locking up foreigners in America today? <laughs> It'd be for thirty percent of the population. You wouldn't. Know. We are all foreigners today. Uh, so I think that my answer about the technology is: I think it's a fantastic enabler. It's an instrument. The question is: What are we going to use it for? Are we using it to spy on each other? Or are we using it to share with each other? Are we using it to beat each other? Or are we using it to create mutual prosperity uh, for everybody? And uh, it's only in a human instrument. It's not something else. Everything depends on the people who use it, and the motivations we use it, and the systems we use it for. Uh, and they have to change, no, no doubt about it. But I think it's a great promise. But I don't think it's the solution. <laughs> I don't think with the same leadership that uh, technology is going to solve our problems. I don't think with the same mentality, I don't think with the same education that technology can solve all our problems because it's only one part. But if we can take the education, the technology, the global awareness, the psychological maturity and understanding and the values that link us all together, I think technology is a great, just like money. You know, money can money can create great prosperity or great impoverishment. Uh, it can be used to fund wars or it can be used to fund global prosperity. Uh, it's a question of how we use it. It's a wonderful why like language. Language is one of our greatest inventions. And maybe uh, you know we'll put it uh, beyond before agriculture. We can't communicate without it. But what are we using it for? Are we using it to cheat the other person, abuse him, <laughs> outsmart him? Or are we using to learn from him and uh, and and create harmonies uh, and grow together uh, and benefit from our companionship? I guess to end that, and Gary, in, in literature, yeah. I wanted to I just uh, cue you on on literature. Well, I would like to uh, cue. Uh, I'm glad you raised it because you know uh, late in life I realized if I really wanted to learn about people. I shouldn't have studied psychology. I should have studied literature. And I only learned that after coming to India. And I spent the last 30, 40 years learning how much you could learn about from literature. And the odd thing is that the thing I'm learning is a subject that I didn't even know existed when I was growing up in the university. I thought I at least knew what everybody else was studying. It was life. We don't teach people about life. We teach people about psychological problems or economic problems or uh, technological uh, technologies and scientific discoveries and things like that. But we, we act as if life doesn't exist, that it's just the, the space in which we act and it doesn't. But there's so much that we can learn from literature about life, about what succeeds and what fails, about what human characteristics lead to accomplishment 
and which are the ones that generate problems about the importance of values. Uh, I'd like to ask Janani, because she's just written a book on this, uh, taking, uh, taking Western literature and looking at some of the wisdom that she's got, got inherited from Indian culture and seeing how much of it you can learn. We didn't, I didn't learn literature that way when I was growing up. I learned to you know, know the plot and analyze the characters and everything else. But we're missing the heart of what this is, the vision that, uh, that these authors had that really makes their literature great. Janani? Thank you, Janani. We use stories even before children start formal schooling to teach them. All our fables and folk stories of every culture around the world have, have great educational value. But then when we begin formal schooling, we, we change what we define as knowledge. We sterilize what, what we consider objective scientific facts of all that is subjective. But almost all our problems today can be traced in one way or another to this artificial separation that we make. Now, literature can act as a bridge between two subjects, between what we know and what we wish to learn, between the objective facts and the subjective dimensions of, of, of life between us and the world around. And, and literature can be used to complement the study of any academic discipline because understanding, retaining, and using knowledge is greatest when we relate deeply, emotionally to what we learn. And it is easier to relate to a human story than to an abstract academic theory. So when we use uh, literature to, to the extent it is possible while teaching each subject, the learning becomes more effective and there is uh, no event in history or, or discovery in science that has not generated uh, fiction or, or any kind of literature based on that development. Uh, the hardship of, say, the Industrial Revolution, the human side of it is captured in, in uh, several of Charles Dickens' novels. Understanding this can let us you know, anticipate the side effects of any development instead of regretting many of the, the, the negative consequences of our technological advances like we very often do today. And, and we get various viewpoints from literature. We can see the same issue, say, uh, slavery, when, when you compare Uncle Tom's Cabin and Gone with the Wind. In our interactions today between two persons or, or two nations, when we try to prove you know, which side is right and which side is wrong, such a perspective will be most, most helpful to us. There is not a single characteristic or personality trait or behavior that uh, one does not find in literature. So this would, uh, reading Shakespeare would be actually a great education in human psychology, you know, consciously or unconsciously. Writers capture the life around them in their writings because literature is just a reflection of the world around us and of life itself. So uh, a study of literature, it can be a, a complement to our study of any academic subject. And several ideas that we discussed today, such as contextual learning, transdisciplinarity, the, the social responsibility of knowledge, of intuitive learning, of values can be fostered by literature. So I think we have a very valuable tool here waiting for us to, to make use of and benefit from. Thank you. Thank you very much, Janani. Gary, um, I, I have a question that is related to something that you have been saying throughout the whole talk. And I think this was most beautifully illustrated by your reflection on how young people felt themselves during the Cold War, sort of passivizing uh, moment. And uh, I was, let's say, I, I basically touched the end of it when I was a young kid, but I remember this, um, on one hand, this kind of constant terror, because I, I later in my life, uh, when I grew up, I learned that I lived in the city and I grew up in the city, which was a scientific city dedicated to nuclear research. Mm -hmm. And uh, with the uh, uh, American military doctrine, there were approximately 70 nuclear missiles directed at my hometown because there were many research facilities that could produce uh, nuclear weapons potentially. There was peaceful applications, but they potentially could be converted. So. The city would be evaporated in, a, in basically a second. I lived all my childhood in that space, and uh, it, it really felt, and I felt like every 
uh, New Year, I, I made a New Year reservation. I kind of prayed <laughs> uh, that the next year wouldn't be a year of nuclear war. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And that uh, passivizing attitude, I think now changes because uh, with climate change, it's not just, let's say, uh, politicians business or, or military uh, generals business. It, it is everyone's uh, challenge as many other challenges that we're facing now, they're, they're not, uh, they cannot be allocated to, let's say, uh, people in high places to make decisions for the fate of humanity and the fate of planet. And you constantly keep on saying, we need a new model of leadership. We need a new, new way of leading and young people need to learn that. So my question is, uh, how do you see that model of leadership and how can education support uh, the creation of this new leadership capacity? Well, Pablo, that's a wonderful question. And your narrative about what you were feeling when you were growing up, I, I know what that's like, though I was not in a particularly targeted point. But I happened to be, uh, my first visit to Moscow was in 1989 just one month, two months before the fall of the Berlin Wall and the, the miracles of what happened at that time, we were all under a tremendous pressure uh, of, uh, of being in a world where we felt helpless by a system you know, that somehow had come into uh, this opposition and we couldn't get out of it. And yet the whole thing just collapsed Overnight almost, just literally uh, overnight, changed unimaginably. You know, I never met, I went to Moscow about 15 times in the next four years, before and after the breakup of the Soviet Union, before the collapse of the Communist Party, before the opening up of the world and the reunification, and then during the reunification of Germany. I never met a person either on this side or that side who knew what was going to happen who predicted, oh, now we have a great opportunity to change the world. We went, you know, I went there on a peace mission as part of an international commission. I'm almost embarrassed to tell you what our goal was. We wanted to reduce world military spending by 3% because it had reached an all-time high. At that time, it was $1.2 trillion. And we wanted, we didn't want people to laugh at us and, you know, and ridicule us for our utopian idealism. So we went around creating an organization and we had internet to say three percent. We instead of it going up by another 10%, we want to reduce it by 3%. And people, some people were skeptical and some people were supportive. And well, there's encouraging developments and everything, but nobody ever said to us, you're a fool. Why do you want 3%? Make it 30%. 30%? Don't be stupid. <laughs> you, don't, you know, I don't have the courage to have people laugh at me. Within four years, world military spending declined by 33%. Nobody saw it happening. If we had gone and said, why don't we bring down the Berlin Wall, break up the Soviet Union, stop the Warsaw Pact, end the confrontation between East and West, do the nuclear arms deal, and, and reunify Germany in the pact. You know, in July of 1989, President Gorbachev and German Chancellor Kohl met privately. It's not a published document, but I know somebody who was in the room who became a, a senior fellow of the World Academy, who was there and an aide to Gorbachev at that time. And they were talking confidentially, July 1989, and said, you know, they both agreed confidentially that the reunification of Germany was probably inevitable. It's going to happen sooner or later. They both agreed it, it will happen and it should happen sooner or later. But they also agreed it would take at least 50 years because the world just doesn't change that fast. And what happened? <laughs> within 12 months, within 12 months, Germany was reunified. What does that tell us? 
the greatest leaders who pioneered this thing, who pushed it through. If anybody knew what was possible, they should have been the ones who knew. They had absolutely no idea. And that taught me something important. It taught me not about them, not that they're foolish or politicians are foolish. It taught us about my, our mind. Our mind is like a rear view mirror. It's really good at looking at things after they've happened and telling us how we got from there to here and making it sound very rational. But ask it to look forward and tell what's going to happen tomorrow. Never rely on it. It's blind. And that's an important thing to know, because then we should know that not only things could get much worse, but things could dramatically change for the better if only we didn't believe that they cannot, as long, if, as long as we don't believe that we're helpless and there's no scope. So what happened? The world changed trans dramatically in a four-year period beyond recognition. And then you had the EU coming up within, in, in, in 92, and then you had World Trade Organization, and then you had the internet. The internet could never have happened in the Cold War period. It would it had been used only for military purposes and all. My point is, what can happen now? What can happen now when we're not blinded by the fact that we're using a rear view mirror and trying to predict the future? Let's use our vision and our, our aspiration to do it. And then we'll really see the possibilities are there. And it can happen really fast. And it can happen really dramatically. And we do see it in, in some things. But how do we really make that happen? We have to believe in it. And that's the youth, that's what we have to give the youth. We have to give them the faith and confidence and, and, and capacity and right to think for themselves and, and empower them to act, uh, because that's the future for us. Not to believe in our history and say, oh, we've made so many mistakes in the past. We have progressed. Why not make this the next uh, 1990? <laughs> Uh, that we didn't see coming until it had already passed. Why not indeed, Gary? Perfect. Uh, and, and, you know, we are now uh, at the very end of our time together with you. Thank you so much for this. But just maybe a little reflection as we wrap up here with you. And again, just for me on this last part that you were saying here, you know, the, the, the metaphors of the rearview mirror, that the rationality, what it can take us from, you know, and how we are driving down the road only judging the curves ahead by looking in the rearview mirror, not very good in terms of, but shining the light of intuition, that shines ahead, seeing what is interpreted, what, what, what is sensing into possible, probable, desirable futures. And you have brought that to the fore beautifully and powerfully, also in the way you have shared things. So thank you again for being, Gary. Um, Three quick questions, and maybe because again we are supposed to be wrapping up in the next uh, three five minutes. Um, if you could uh, maybe share with us quickly your highest hope, your deepest concern, and your essential message. Wow, <laughs> three minutes. <laughs> My highest hope that 1990 was just a preparation. We're a better, we're a better world with more enlightenment, with more dedicated people today, with a stronger civil, there was no global civil society then. We have more resources and capacities to do the right thing today than ever before. And there's no shortage of dedicated people who really who re recognize the problem and want to change it. Uh, that's my uh that's that's my aspiration, and I believe it's really possible. Uh, it's not going to happen by itself. We can't sit back and wait for it to happen. But that's my answer to the first one. The second one was my deepest fear. <laughs> my, deepest deepest, concern. Concern. my deepest concern is that, as in the past, we tend to change only when we're compelled. Even when we have the capacity to change, we went through two world wars to finally create an international system which for all its weaknesses is a, is a standing miracle. We now have for the first time in human history of thousands of years, a group of institutions where 193 countries come together and they agree on something. We know our differences, 
But they agree on 193 countries have agreed on these 17 sustainable development goals and 100 and we all want to do this and we're committed. The fact that they are not, not we're not doing it the way we want it is not just the fault of governments. We need the support of the whole society to do that. But never before in history have we agreed on anything, 193 of us. There's no record of it. We never even tried. We never talked to each other. We didn't even know each other. We had no means of, of getting together before. So I guess I, I, I guess my worst fear is or uh, is that we shouldn't wait uh, until things get really bad again in order to make the next step in our progress. We've had enough lessons. We know how to do it. We can do it. Uh, and uh, uh, we need a kick in the pants, no doubt. <laughs> and we're getting them. We have enough of them. I think COVID and the, the current war and the COVID, the, the climate is enough incentive for us to, to get our act together. We need some leaders for that. The third, I don't remember what your third you, you one was. You more or less covered it. It was, what okay, is your but, essential message you would like well, to Well, my essential message then, which is an answer to the third, and maybe to Pavel's question, which I didn't properly answer because I got carried away by, uh, by the question. Uh, I'm a, a business consultant. Personally, I'm, I believe that uh, a life, a, a spiritual life of trying to do something that's in harmony with the rest of the world and other people and is really growth is the single most important thing to me. I think for our survival, it's the single most important thing we have to do with the environment. But I learned something, and I, I never wanted to go study business. Uh, when I came to India, I, I, I met a teacher, and I, I, he started talking about business. I said, my father was a successful businessman. He earned a lot of money. Why? I didn't come to India for that. He said, you're an idiot. Business is the, 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 the field in which humanity has come together and reached out over the world. Business is the science of accomplishment. The only thing you need to know is what determines whether that accomplishment is for good or for bad for everybody or for a few people and everything. And so I did a study of 20 of the most successful companies in the history of America at that time. And I found something that really surprised me. The real formula behind the companies that succeeded year after year, decade after decade with new technologies and all the changes were the companies that really believed in values. That's not what I learned in business school. That's not what I was taught in economics. You know, we were taught it's competitiveness and, 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 uh, and eff efficiency and everything else. And since then, I have met hundreds of leaders in different fields, maybe thousands of leaders in different fields. And I have found the real secret for accomplishment, not just getting, not just money or not money, but of doing something positive that's going to be lasting and building is values. Values are really, to me, the quintessence of wisdom passed on from the past. I'm not talking about the scriptures and the, the, the proverbs and all the beliefs and teachings that come. Basic thing that human values are the wisdom for our future accomplishment. We don't need to discover anything else. Harmony, goodwill, self-giving, truthfulness. Uh, I'm not talking platitudes, really practically. If we practice that, we will solve all the problems, trust and trustworthiness. So I think the message is really simple. Uh, and uh, that's what we should be teaching, not as a moral principle to memorize and repeat you know, to others, but as a truth of life. That's what Janani was talking about in literature. If you read the literature, you'll see the real accomplishment came from people who had those qualities in them. Maybe they're not all saints, but they had something really valuable. Uh, and those values are valuable. That's what I wanted to say. Thank you so much. Thank you, Gary. Pavel? Thank, Thank you, you, Gary. Um, I deeply enjoyed the conversation today. And I hope uh, that our audience did as well. And um, I hope that your message will be taken in and really brought into life by those who listen to it. So thank you very much. And uh, it's always a pleasure to speak with you, Gary, and to be inspired by your thinking, your 
life work, your hard work. And uh, let us hope that this dream of the future education becomes real very, very soon. Like you say, we don't need to wait 50 years. We can do it in 12 months, maybe. <laughs> so why not? <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you for the invitation and the opportunity. I'm just delighted to be here with you. Wish you all the best. Thank you. Be well. Take care.